Shall we pray? Almighty, glorious, and omniscient Father, what a joy it is to be in your presence. We thank you, Father, that we can gather together as one to open your holy word and learn about your love and also learn what you expect from us as your children. We ask, Father, that as we open the pages of your holy book, that the Holy Spirit will be present through the ministry of the angels. I ask, Lord, that you will give us understanding that we might be able to properly and correctly trace the word of truth. And we thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to review briefly the chronology of the events of the life of Christ that we have been studying in the sanctuary service. The first point that I would like to review is that Jesus came to this earth to live in the camp with us. And in the camp, Jesus lived the perfect life that the law demands from all of us. In other words, Jesus lived the life that we should live. And then we notice that Jesus went from the camp into the court. And in the court, at the altar of sacrifice, Jesus died for our sins. He died for all. So in the camp, he lived the life that we should live. In the court, he died the death that all of us should suffer. And then we notice that Jesus resurrected at the labor. That's the second item of furniture that was found in the sanctuary court. So he resurrected in the labor, and then we noticed in our last study that Jesus went from earth and entered which apartment of the sanctuary, of the heavenly sanctuary? He entered the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Now, between the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension, we have a period of 40 days. 40 days between when Jesus resurrected and when Jesus ascended to heaven. After spending those 40 days with his disciples, the Bible says, speaking to them about things pertaining to the kingdom of God, in other words, explaining the Bible prophecies to them, the Bible tells us that Jesus ascended to heaven from the Mount of Olives. Let's read the description that the Bible gives of the ascension of Jesus 40 days after his resurrection. It's found in Acts chapter 1 and verses 9 through 11. Acts chapter 1 and verses 9 through 11. It says here, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, notice, this same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And so Jesus disappeared from their sight. The Bible tells us that the disciples then returned to the city of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives and went back to the upper room where Jesus had instituted the Lord's Supper with them. The Bible tells us that for the next 10 days after the ascension of Christ, the disciples gathered together in one accord in the upper room. The Bible tells us that they prayed together. The Bible tells us that they studied the prophecies together. The Bible tells us that they ironed out their differences. They emptied themselves of self through the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, they prepared during those 10 days 
for the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. Meanwhile, during those 10 days, Jesus in heaven was being invested as the high priest over his people. In other words, Jesus had entered the holy place of the sanctuary in order to begin his ministration there to pour out the benefits of what he had done on earth. Now, it's interesting to notice who was present there in the upper room during those 10 days. Go with me to Acts chapter 1 and verse 13. Acts chapter 1 and verse 13. And by the way, uh, if you have Acts 2 verse 13 on your list, that is a misprint. Now, who was present there in the upper room? It says there in Acts 1 verse 13, and when they had entered, this is the upper room, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. And now notice the enumeration of the apostles that were present there. Peter, who's always mentioned first on all of the lists because he was always the first to speak. He had leadership abilities. Peter, James, John, that's three, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. Now as we examine this list, it's very interesting that we have only 11 apostles. How many apostles did Jesus choose? Jesus chose 12 apostles, but here we have listed only 11 apostles. One of the 12 was missing. Now the question is, who was missing there in the upper room? Well, the answer is obvious. It was Judas Iscariot. In fact, let's read the description that Peter gave about what happened to Judas Iscariot and why he wasn't there. Acts chapter 1 and beginning with verse 16 tells us the sad and tragic story of Judas, one of the twelve. It says here, here Peter is speaking, men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered, I want you to remember that's a key word, for he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Notice Judas was numbered with the twelve. That word numbered is very, very important. Now notice what it continues saying in verse 18. This is a parenthetical description about what happened to Judas. It says, Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. A pretty vivid description. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that field is called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. Now, the Bible appears to be contradictory with regards to the end of Judas, because here it says that he fell headlong and his, uh, his stomach exploded and his entrails came out. Other texts say that Judas went off and did what? He hung himself. So how do you reconcile these two ideas? Well, Ellen White explains in a beautiful way how both of these statements are true. She says that Judas hung himself over a ledge on a branch of a tree. In other words, he, he put the, the noose over, uh, he put the rope over that branch, and he hung himself by throwing himself off the cliff. And he was so heavy that the branch broke, and he fell a great distance to the ground. And when he fell to the ground, his belly burst open and his entrails came out. And she says that later on when Jesus was coming on the Via Dolorosa to, to die on Mount Calvary, uh, the people were horrified because they saw that the dogs were eating the entrails of Judas. And that's how Judas ended his existence. 
So I want you to notice that there were only 11 apostles in the upper room because Judas had committed suicide and he had fallen a great distance and uh, he, of course, was not numbered among the 12 anymore. Now, we need to ask a very important question, and it's this. After Peter told the tragic story, the sad story of Judas, Peter stated to the disciples that they needed to elect a successor for Judas. They needed to elect someone to take the place of Judas. In fact, Peter said, this is absolutely mandatory. We must elect a successor. We must elect an apostle number 12. Now the question is, why did Peter feel that they had to elect a successor for Judas or an apostle number 12? The fact is that Bible prophecy made it imperative to elect a successor for Judas. In other words, Peter and the disciples had studied Bible prophecy, and they knew that Bible prophecy had predicted what was going to happen to Judas, and also predicted that somebody needed to take his office. Somebody need to take, needed to take his place. Now let's read that in Acts chapter 1 and verse 16. Acts chapter 1 and verse 16. Here, Peter is still speaking, and he says, Men and brethren, this scripture, now notice, had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Did prophecy have to be fulfilled, yes or no? Peter says this is not optional. This had to happen. The Holy Spirit spoke it, and it had to happen. Now, let's jump down to verse 20 so that we can see which prophecies that David wrote made it mandatory to elect a successor for Judas. Verse 20, for it is written in the book of Psalms. See, this is where the prophecies come from. It is written in the book of Psalms, let, speaking about Judas, let his dwelling place be what? Desolate and let no one live in it. In other words, that says that he was no longer going to come to his house. But there was another prophecy. By the way, that prophecy is in Psalm 69 and verse 25. But another prophecy in Psalm 109 and verses 7 and 8 states that his place needed to be taken by somebody else. In fact, it says, let another take his office. And so the reason why Peter felt that it was indispensable, mandatory for a successor to be named for Judas was because prophecy predicted what was going to happen to Judas and prophecy made it mandatory to elect someone to take his office. Now, there's this myth that some Christians have, and that is that the disciples in the upper room rushed to elect a successor for Judas. In fact, they think that it was God's plan that they wait a while and deliberate and pray longer about this before they elected whom they elected. In fact, many of these Christians think that it was the Apostle Paul who should have been Apostle number 12. But the disciples, you know, they rushed and they elected Matthias when it was not in harmony with God's plan. So the argument goes. But I sustain that this is not true. This is a myth. In other words, this is an unwarranted assumption that God wanted Saul of Tarsus to be apostle number 12. The fact is that the apostle that was elected is the one that God wanted to be elected. And you say, how do we know this? For three reasons. Let's notice reason number one in Acts chapter 1 and verses 21 and 22. Acts chapter 1 and verses 21 and 22. And by the way, where is Jesus while this is happening? During these 10 days, where is Jesus? Jesus is in the holy place. And what's happening there? Jesus is being invested and prepared on the day of Pentecost to begin his service as what? As high priest, to pour out the benefits of his atonement. Notice Acts chapter 1, verse 21. 
Here is the qualification that was needed for the successor of Judas. Therefore, Peter is speaking of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. What was the qualification that was indispensable? It had to be somebody that was with the apostles from the preaching of John the Baptist till when? Till Jesus resurrected and ascended to heaven. Question, does Saul of Tarsus meet that specification? Absolutely not. There's a second reason. There's three that I'm going to share. A second reason. The fact is that the Bible record tells us that the disciples, the apostles, followed the correct process. Notice Acts chapter 1 and verses 24 through 26. Acts chapter 1 and verses 24 through 26. It says here, and they what? They prayed and said, you, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen? Show us what? Which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place? And they cast lots, which was the way of doing it in biblical times. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Matthias. And now notice this very important expression. And he was what? Numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, notice that we were told that Judas was numbered with the 12. Here it says that Matthias, when he was elected, was what? Was numbered with the 12. Is the number 12 extremely important? Absolutely, according to the biblical record. Now, there's a third reason why we know that Matthias was God's choice. And that is a statement that was made by Ellen White in confirmation of what we've seen from Scripture. See, first we go to Scripture, and then we see what Ellen White has to say about it. Ellen White does not add anything to Scripture that is not contained in Scripture and principles. She is not another Bible. She doesn't add information that is not contained in the Bible. She simply amplifies, explains, simplifies, and helps us understand better what is already contained in Scripture. Now notice what she says in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, page 264. Listen carefully. Two men were selected who, in the careful judgment of the believers, in the what? Careful judgment of the believers, were best qualified for the place. Now notice this. But the disciples, distrusting their ability to decide the question further, referred it to one that knew all hearts. They sought the Lord in prayer, to ascertain which of the two men was more suitable for the important position of trust as an apostle of Christ. And now listen carefully. The Spirit of God selected Matthias for the office. Who selected Matthias for the office? The Spirit of God selected Matthias for the office. So was it God's plan that Matthias be numbered with the other 11 apostles? Absolutely, for the three reasons that I've mentioned. Now let's review two points that we've covered so far, two key points. Number one, Old Testament prophecy had announced that Judas was going to apostatize, and Old Testament prophecy had said that, an elect, that, that a successor needed to be elected. Second point is that the disciples followed the correct steps in electing the successor for Judas. But now we need to ask another very important question. We already asked the question why they felt it was necessary to elect a successor. Well, because prophecy said so. But now here is a very important question. Why did the apostles feel like they needed to elect a successor for Judas before the day of Pentecost? Are you understanding the difference between the first question and the second question? First question is, why did they feel like they had to elect a successor? 
The answer is because prophecy said so. But the question is, why did they feel it was indispensable to elect a successor before the day of Pentecost had come? Why not just uh, wait for a while? You know, why not just pray and study together and wait for God to pour out His Holy Spirit? And then after God pours out His Holy Spirit, they could take a little while longer maybe to pray more and to find out what God, God's will was. Why would they feel it was urgent to name a successor for Judas immediately before the day of Pentecost had come? Why did they feel it was absolutely indispensable to elect apostle number 12 to be numbered with the other 11 before the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost? The fact is that in the next few minutes, you're going to see that whenever the Bible has details, every detail is vitally important. What we're going to study now proves, uh, to me anyway, that the Bible doesn't miss any important details. The Bible, when you study it carefully, you find a reason for everything that it states. Why things are done in the way that they're done, and w when they are done, and why they are done in a certain way. Now, in order to understand why they felt it was absolutely urgent to elect a successor for Judas before the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, we need to understand the significance in the Bible of the number 12. What do we need to understand? The significance of the number 12. See, there had to be 12. Judas was numbered with the 12. Matthias was numbered with the 12. The number 12 is vitally important. So what does the number 12 represent? Well, go with me to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. This is a verse that uh, we're going to take a look at a little more closely later on in the seminar, but now I want to underline just two points in this verse. Revelation 12 verse 1 says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman. A what? A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 13 stars. Thank you. I just wanted to see if you were still with me, and you're, if you're looking up the verses. It says, and on her head a garland, that is a crown of what? Of 12 stars. Now, let's ask the question, what does this woman represent? Immediately, the answer is correct. The woman represents the church. Now the question is, how do we know that in symbolic prophecy a woman represents the church? And by the way, it's just not any church, it's not the entirety of the church, it is the true faithful church that is represented by this woman. You say, how do you know that? Let's compare two verses. One is found in Daniel 7.25, and the other is in Revelation 12, 13, and 14. We're going to compare these two verses to determine what is meant by the woman here in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. You know, whenever I ask what does the woman represent in prophecy, the answer is always, oh, the church. And we usually use Ephesians 5 where it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And that's a good verse. But, you know, we don't even have to go uh, outside of Daniel and Revelation to discover what a woman represents in prophecy because Daniel and Revelation themselves explain what the woman represents. Now go with me to Daniel 7 verse 25. This is a prophecy we're going to study in a couple of lectures. It's speaking about a little horn. Many of you were through this evangelistic series recently. What does the little horn represent? The little horn represents what? What power? It represents the Roman church, the Roman Catholic papacy. Now notice Daniel 7.25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. And now comes a very important detail. Shall persecute whom? The saints of the Most High. The little horn would persecute the saints of the Most High. Shall intend to change times and law. And the question is, how long were the saints going to be persecuted by this power? Notice. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and what? And times and half a time. Who is it that persecuted uh, the saints for time, times, and half a time? 
the little horn, right? But now let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And let's read verses uh, 13 and 14. This is a parallel prophecy. And I want you to notice something very interesting here. It says there in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 13, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, now listen carefully, he persecuted whom? The woman. So in Daniel 7, it's the little horn that persecutes the saints, right? Did, did you notice that? In Daniel 7, the little horn persecutes the saints. Here, it's the dragon persecuting whom? The woman. Now, you say, but how do you know that the woman is the same as the saints? Let's continue reading. So it says, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Are you catching the parallel here? Parallel here? In Daniel chapter 7, it's the little horn that persecutes whom? The saints. Uh, for how long? Time, times, the dividing of time. Revelation 12, it's the dragon who persecutes whom? The woman for time, times, the dividing of time. So the question is this. What does the woman represent? She represents, according to Daniel 7, the what? The saints. Did you catch that parallel? So the woman represents the saints. So is this woman just the church in general, faithful and unfaithful? No, it represents the faithful church of Jesus Christ. The saint, the woman, represents what? Represents the saints. But now we need to ask the question, at what stage of the history of God's people does this woman of Revelation chapter 12 represent? You know, God's people, did God have a people in the Old Testament? What was the name of his Old Testament people? Israel. Does he have a New Testament people? Yes, it's called the what? It's called the Christian church. And so we have two stages. God has his Old Testament people and he has his New Testament people. Now the question is, in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1, which stage is being described? The Old Testament faithful church or the New Testament faithful church? The fact is that Revelation 12 verse 1 is describing the Old Testament faithful church. And you say, how do you know that? Well, let's go back to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. It says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. And then if you read verse 2 and verse 3, it says very clearly that the woman had what in her womb? She had what kind of a child? A male child in her womb. Right? And who does that male child represent? Who is that male child? That male child is Jesus Christ. And then it says that the dragon stands next to the woman to devour her child as soon as her child is born. Let me ask you, does the woman exist before the child is born? Of course she does. So which church is this? Is it the New Testament church or the Old Testament church? It has to be the Old Testament church. You can't have a New Testament church without Jesus being born yet. So when John sees her in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1, this is the Old Testament church. By the way, did the Old Testament church bring Jesus into the world? Was Jesus a descendant of Abraham, yes or no? Was Jesus a descendant of David, yes or no? Was Jesus born from the faithful Old Testament church? That's why they are genealogies in Scripture, the genealogy of the faithful of the Old Testament from whom Jesus Christ comes. Are you with me so far? Now, we find then that this woman in Revelation 12 verse 1 represents the Old Testament church. But we're going to notice a little bit later on that la later in the story, the woman comes to represent also the New Testament church. Now, we've noticed that the woman represents the faithful church from where the Messiah is born. 
The woman in Revelation 12, verse 1, represents the Old Testament church because the, the child has not been born from the woman yet. But you'll notice that the woman has a crown, and the crown has how many stars? The crown has 12 stars. Now, the question is, what do the 12 stars represent? They help us identify what this woman represents. Now you say, 12 stars, 12 stars, what could that represent? Go with me to Genesis 37, 9 and 10. It's amazing how many times you have to go to Genesis, right? To find the meaning of Scripture. Genesis 37 and verses 9 and 10. You remember that Joseph had a dream. Actually, he had two dreams before he was taken captive uh, to Egypt. But uh, there's one dream that has sun, moon, and stars. Now let's notice Genesis 37, 9, and 10. It says, Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, by the way, do we have the sun, moon also, and stars in Revelation 12? We most certainly do. So there's a connection. And this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bow down to me. You say, ah, oh, it doesn't say 12. It says 11. But let me ask you, who was star number 12? It was Joseph, of course. How many brothers did, uh, how many sons did Jacob have? He had 12. And so he's saying all of his, the 11 stars bowed to Joseph. Now let's continue reading. So it says in verse 10, so he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? Did, did uh, his father understand very well what the dream meant? Absolutely. So the 12 stars, Joseph being star number 12, represents what? Represents the 12 sons of Jacob. Question, were these the founders of the Old Testament church? Did all of Israel come from these 12? You have 12 individuals, and all of Israel later springs from these 12 individuals. In fact, let's read Genesis 49, verse 28, where it speaks now not only about the sons of Jacob, but it also speaks about once they've proliferated into the 12 tribes. Genesis 49, and verse 28 says, And all these are the what? These 12 sons are the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is what their father spoke to them because he gives a description of what their character is going to be like before this. And he blessed them. He blessed each one according to their own blessing. So you have the founders of the Old Testament church. How many of them? 12 founders of the Old Testament church, 12 literal individuals. But from those 12 literal individuals comes all of Israel, all of the 12 tribes of Israel. In other words, they multiply and they become a great nation. Now, the number 12 also represents the New Testament church. You say, how do you know that? Well, listen up. The Bible tells us that after the child is born in Revelation chapter 12, what does the woman do? We read it. She flees into where? She flees into the wilderness for 1,260 years or time, times, and the dividing of time. Let me ask you, what church is this when the woman flees? Is this still the Old Testament church or is this the New Testament church? This is the New Testament church because the child's been born Verse 5 of Revelation 12 says that the child has been caught up to God into his throne. In other words, he's ascended to heaven. And now the woman has to flee. So now the woman represents what? The New Testament church. Does she still have a crown with 12 stars? Absolutely. She has a crown with 12 stars all the, across her history. Now I want you to notice that God has only one people. He doesn't have two women, one Old Testament people and one New Testament people. He has one people composed of his Old Testament church and his New Testament church because one woman represents God's people in all of its stages. Are you understanding me? Because many Christians say that God has one plan for literal Israel and he has another plan for the church. 
In fact, God has an earthly plan for the Jews, and he has a heavenly plan for the church. God is going to rapture the church to heaven, and then he's going to pick up with, the lit with his other people, the literal Jews on earth. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that God has one people, Old and New Testament, Messiah's people, represented not by two women, but by what? But by one woman. And in both stages, Old and New Testament, she has the crown with 12 stars because there's no evidence that the crown was taken off after the Old Testament church and there's no longer 12 stars. Now let me ask you, how many apostles were appointed by Jesus Christ? Of course, that's coincidental. Jesus thought, oh, let's see, how many apostles? Ah, oh, 12 is a good number. No. The number 12 is the number of his people. In fact, let's notice Mark chapter 3 and verses 14 through 19. And you're saying, Pastor Bohr, when are we coming back to Pentecost and the successor of Judah? See, we have to have all of this background or else we won't understand why the apostles felt it was urgent and indispensable to elect apostle number 12 before the day of Pentecost. There is a biblical reason, a prophetic reason for that. Mark chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. Notice what it says. Speaking about Jesus, then he appointed what? Twelve. That they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. And then you have the names. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, the son of Zebedee. And John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges that is, sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, also called Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. How many apostles formed the New Testament church, the nucleus of the New Testament church from where the whole New Testament church comes. Twelve literal individuals later proliferate through preaching the gospel and they form the Christian church. Just like you have twelve sons of Jacob that proliferate and form the twelve tribes of Israel. Now listen to what Ellen White had to say about the number 12. You know, I never cease to marvel when I study Scripture because what I do first is I always go and I study Scripture, and then after I study Scripture, I say, I wonder what Ellen White has to say about this. I want you to notice what she says in the book Acts of the Apostles, page 19. As in the Old Testament, the 12 patriarchs stood as representatives of Israel 12 patriarchs are the 12 sons of Jacob. So the 12 apostles stood as representatives of the gospel church. Isn't that simple? The 12 sons of Jacob represented what? The Old Testament church. The 12 apostles represented what? The New Testament church. But it's one church. Because it is represented by a single what? It is represented by a single woman. Now we need to go back to our original question. Why did the disciples feel that it was absolutely indispensable and urgent to elect the successor of Judas before the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost? There is a very important prophetic reason. You see, as we studied in our last lecture, when Jesus ascended to heaven, during the 10 days before the Holy Spirit was poured out, Jesus was being invested as the high priest over his people. In other words, Jesus now, as the Bible says, sat at the right hand of God to give what? Repentance to Israel and what? And forgiveness of sins. In other words, Jesus had begun, at the end of the 10 days, his intercessory ministry for those who come to him in faith, claiming his life and claiming his death as their own. In other words, they could now receive the benefits 
of the atonement of Christ. During those 10 days, Jesus was actually being invested as the high priest over his people. You see, on earth, he had come into the camp to live a life as a simple priest. And then Jesus officiated his own sacrifice as a simple priest. He resurrected at the labor as a simple priest. But now on the day of Pentecost, he is invested as the what? As the high priest over his people. And you say, where does the Bible say that? Well, go with me to Hebrews chapter 8 and verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Here, I believe the Apostle Paul is uh, behind the book of Hebrews. I believe that it's Pauline. Uh, it says the following. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have... He's writing this decades after Jesus ascended to heaven. We have such a what? A high priest who is seated where? At the right hand of the throne of the majesty where? In the heavens. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. What did Jesus do in heaven when he ascended after his ascension? He what? He became the high priest. In which sanctuary? Not the shadowy copy, but in the original sanctuary. In other words, Jesus during those 10 days was invested as the high priest over his people. And on the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was the earthly announcement that the sanctuary was now open for business. Are you understanding me? Now, here comes a very important point. If Jesus was going to be high priest, would he have to be clothed as a high priest? Yes or no? If, would, he have the, would he have that mitre that says holiness to the Lord? Sure. Would he have the multicolored, beautiful garment, different colors? Absolutely. But you know what else he would have? He would also have the breastplate. Now let me read from Scripture a description of the breastplate. Exodus 28. Exodus chapter 28 and let's begin our reading at verse 15. By the way, for those who say that Jesus went directly into the most holy place, here I'm going to read from Scripture that he went as high priest into the holy place. The Scripture makes it absolutely certain, and we also notice that in Revelation that Jesus was walking among the candlesticks, and he was also where the altar of incense was. But now it's explicit in Exodus chapter uh, 28. Let's re begin reading at verse 15. Speaking about the breastplate that the high priest wore over his heart. It says, you shall make the breastplate of judgment. Interesting. The breastplate of what? Of judgment. Whose judgment did Jesus bear? He bore our judgment. Did he go to heaven to represent us before the Father and say, Father, I was judged in his place. I was judged in her place. Please accept him or her in the beloved. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it says, you shall make the breastplate of judgment artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod. You shall make it of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen you shall make it. It shall be doubled into a square. A span shall be its length, and a span shall be its width. In other words, it was, it was a square. Verse 17. And you shall put settings of stones in it, four rows of stones. The first row shall, uh, row shall be a sardius, a topaz, and an emerald. This shall be the first row. The second row shall be a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold settings. So you have this square breastplate that has how many stones on it? It has 12, not 11. It has 12 stones. What do those 12 stones represent? 
They represent God's what? God's people from the Old and from the New Testament. Notice what it continues saying in verse uh, 21. And the stones shall have, listen to this, shall have the names of the sons of Israel, 12 according to their names. So what does Jesus wear over his heart? The names of the 12 sons of Jacob, but also the what? The 12 apostles of the Lamb. In other words, where does Jesus hold his people? Dear, close to his what? To his heart, and it's the breastplate of judgment. What did Jesus bear in our place? He bore our judgment. And so it says in verse 21, And the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet. Each one with its own name, they shall be according to the twelve tribes. Let's jump down to verse 29. Listen carefully. So Aaron, what was Aaron, by the way? He was the high priest. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his what? Over his heart. Now listen carefully. When he goes into the holy place, as a memorial before the Lord continually. And by the way, I wondered if that translation, holy place, is the right translation. I went to every Bible version that I could find, and every Bible version says holy place. So where does the high priest wear the breastplate of judgment close to his heart? Not in the most holy, but where? In the holy place of the sanctuary. Verse 29, So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim. We won't get into that. And they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So Aaron shall bear the what? There it is, the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord, what? Before the Lord, continually. Now we understand why they had to have apostle number 12 before Jesus was invested in high priest. See, there's a biblical reason. What would have happened if they had only 11 apostles before the day of Pentecost? Jesus could not wear the breastplate which had 12 stones. Are you understanding me? The breastplate had to have what? Twelve stones, symbolic of God's people. But there were only eleven apostles. So what did they have to do before Jesus could be clothed as the high priest over his people? Apostle number twelve had to be elected. In other words, there's a biblical reason for this. Isn't the Bible marvelous? I mean, it's amazing. These are things that show me that the Bible is inspired by God. It doesn't miss a beat. Now notice this comment by Ellen White, Gospel Workers, page 34. I love this statement. She says, Of Aaron, the high priest of Israel, it is written, He shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth into the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. And then she makes this comment. After reading Exodus 28, verse 29, or uh, writing it, she says, What a beautiful and expressive figure this is of the unchanging love of Christ for his church. Our great high priest, of whom Aaron was a type, bears his people upon his heart. And then she says to the ministers, and by the way, all of us are ministers to share the gospel. She says, and should not his earthly ministers share his love and sympathy and solicitude? Do you know there is nothing closer to Jesus Christ than his church, than the individuals in his church? You see, the 12 sons of Jacob and the 12 apostles of the Lamb represent God's people in all ages. And the thing that is closest to the heart of Jesus are his people. In fact, when Jesus was raising up his high priestly prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was interceding for his disciples and those who would believe in him afterwards. 
he expressed at the climax of his prayer what his great desire was. He said in John chapter 17 and verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. What does Jesus want? He wants his people where? With him. That they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. And you know, sometimes we read that passage, which we'll come back to later on in this series, in John 14, 1 to 3, where uh, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And usually we focus on the mansion. Oh, we're going to have a mansion up there. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And many people think that Jesus is doing some heavenly contracting up there. He's building houses. Listen, Jesus doesn't need 2,000 years to build houses. When he made this world in six days, he can speak and it is done. He went to the sanctuary to apply the benefits of his atonement to individuals. Are you understanding? Is the work of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary as important as his death on the cross? Absolutely. You cannot be saved without administration in the heavenly sanctuary, in the holy place. And later we're going to talk about his ministration in the most holy place that begins in the year 1844. John 14 verse 3 expresses what Jesus was really concerned about. He said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and now listen carefully, and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What is the passion of Jesus? The passion of Jesus is that we are there where he is. Listen, the beautiful city and the, and the mansions are the icing and the cake. They are the dessert. But if there was nothing in heaven... None of those fringe benefits, so to speak. And Jesus was there, it would be worthwhile going. Amen. Notice Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 27. You know, I get kind of aggravated when I hear, hear people criticizing the church and being critical of the church. Listen, Jesus loves his church and he takes it personally. That doesn't mean that we don't have to correct wrongs that are committed in the church, but it's Christ's church and there will be Wheat and there will be tears until probation closes. But let's not be critical. Let's not shoot our wounded like many times happens. Notice Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. What did Jesus do for his church? He what? He gave himself. He didn't give us something. He gave us himself. Gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself. Listen to this. The final end of, of what Jesus is looking for, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. This is the reason why Ellen White wrote in Testimonies to Ministers, page 15, I testify to my brethren and sisters that the church of Christ, enfeebled and defective as it may be, is the only object on earth upon which he bestows his supreme regard. While he extends to all the world his invitation to come to him and be saved, he commissions his angels to render divine help to every soul that cometh to him in repentance and contrition. And he comes personally by his Holy Spirit in the midst, into the midst of his church. Now one final thing that I want to deal with. And that is that our home in eternity, both in heaven and on the new earth, will be the new Jerusalem the holy city. Now let me ask you, are, is the Old Testament church and is the New Testament church, are they both represented in the holy city? Absolutely. Let's finish by reading two verses. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 12. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 12. It's speaking about the gates of the new Jerusalem. This is an old Jerusalem. This is the new Jerusalem. And notice the names that are on the gates. It says there in Revelation 21 verse 12, also she had a great and high wall with 12 gates. 
and twelve angels at the gates, and now notice, and names written on them, which are the what? The names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Is the Old Testament church going to be represented in the city? Absolutely. How about the New Testament church in the same city? Revelation chapter 21 and verse 14. Revelation 21 verse 14. It's speaking about the foundations of the holy city now. The gates have the names of the sons of Jacob, but the foundations have different names. Notice Revelation 21 and verse 14. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. One city that contains all of God's people, Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, everyone will live in the presence of Jesus Christ forevermore. And the Bible says that we will come from month to month to eat from the tree of life. And the Bible says that we will come from Sabbath to Sabbath to worship our wonderful creator, Jesus Christ. And we shall live with him forevermore. In that land where there is no sorrow, no crying, no suffering, no illness, no death. That land where everything is joy forevermore. And the greatest joy, of course, is the joy of spending eternity with our wonderful and beloved Savior, Jesus Christ, who did not give us something, but actually gave us himself. He did not lend himself to us. He gave himself for us, not for a while, but for eternity. We have an elder brother sitting on the throne. Mm -hmm.